wissen möchte. Man muss sie einfach bewundern für ihren Einsatz, für ihre positive Ausstrahlung, die sie trotz ihrer ernsten Botschaften immer mitnimmt. Dr. Jane Goodall ist heute hier bei uns in Nürnberg. In Davos hat sie gesagt, dass viele Menschen, vor allem junge Menschen, verzweifelt sind aufgrund der vielen schlechten Nachrichten, die wir tagtäglich hören. Aber es gebe gleichzeitig eben auch Hoffnung, weil eben auch viele Menschen den Mut aufbringen für Veränderungen. Sie ist eine Grammdame des Tier- und Umweltschutzes und ich möchte Sie einmal darauf hinweisen, wenn Sie gleich Fotos machen, bitte benutzen Sie keinen Blitz, das wäre sehr freundlich von Ihnen. Und jetzt begrüße ich ganz herzlich Dr. Jane Goodall. Warm welcome to you on the stage. Upon it. 
So why did I leave the forest? I left because I realized in 1986, right across Africa, forest and chimpanzees were disappearing. And I traveled around Africa to learn more about it. I learned that one of the problems was crippling poverty of so many people living in and around the forest so that they were destroying the forest in order to live, killing the animals in order to survive. I began traveling around the world talking about these things. And that's when I learned the extent to which we are damaging this beautiful planet. And it brought me back to, yes, chimpanzees are like us in so many ways. We share 98.6 of the composition of our DNA with them. And yet we're different. And the main difference, I believe, is this explosive development of our intellect. So how bizarre that the most intellectual creature that's ever walked this planet is destroying its only home. We used to think we might be able to live on Mars, but our brilliant brains have created a rocket that went up to Mars and little robots being taking photographs. We know we can't live there. We've got this one beautiful green and blue planet, and day by day we are destroying it. We have to stop. Well, one of the big problems is what is called conventional agriculture. Can anybody tell me how that conventional was attached to this very unconventional way of growing food? <laughs> I prefer to call it industrial agriculture. And it's this industrial agriculture that is doing something which highlights what I just said about how this most intellectual creature can destroy its only home. Who can possibly have thought that it was a good idea to spread chemical poisons onto our fields to grow our food, to feed our children? And we've only got to look at what this system has done to the environment to realize what a huge mistake it is. Let's take, our, let's take herbicide. And when I think of herbicide, my mind goes to Roundup, Roundup-ready crops. Genetic modified crops come into this equation. You grow a crop which has got ingrown resistance, to the herbicide, you spray the herbicide on it. It doesn't matter how much you spray, your crop's going to grow. It's strong, it can resist it. But the agricultural weeds, they become resistant to it as well. And farmers were becoming desperate. They were putting more and more fertilizer on the land, destroying the soil. And when farmers went to Monsanto and said, well, what can we do? We can't grow our crops anymore because of these weeds. They were told to give a, a chemical uh, cocktail, and the main ingredient of that was Agent Orange. That's what we're doing to the land. You all know about Agent Orange and the Vietnam War and the terrible results that have come. People still suffering from the, being, being contaminated by Agent Orange. So the soil is something which has only recently become a subject of intensive study. And we don't know very much about the, the ecosystem of the soil that's down under our feet. We don't think about it. But as we continue to use these chemical poisons on the fields and causing the destruction of so many plants and the native plants, which is in turn leading to the lack of food for a lot of our insects. And then we've got the pesticides, and of course it's become very widely talked about now how the pesticides are destroying the honeybees and the bumblebees, the insects that, are, that we depend on for pollinating our crops. If we lose the bees, that's the end. There was a little girl of five the other day, and I asked her what, what her project was. And she said, 
I'm working to save bees. I said, why are you doing that? She said, well, first of all, they're fuzzy and nice. And secondly, if they die, we die too. She had it right there. So here we are faced with this uh, conventional agriculture destroying the soil. We all know, I know it's true in Germany, it's certainly true in, in England where I grew up, that half of the birds and insects that I knew as a child are not there anymore. The butterflies, the birds, the dawn calls in the morning, it's gone. And we're doing it. We, with this amazing intellect of ours, we're letting this happen. Don't we care? Some people do. Fortunately, some people do. But an awful lot of people don't. And that's partly because they don't fully understand. So that's something really important, education. And I find one problem with people who are fighting against the agricultural giants that are poisoning our land. They're very confrontational. And I found certainly that if you're really confrontational, it doesn't get you very far. So how do we get to these people? I think we have to reach the heart. And I do that by telling stories. This intellect of ours that's led us into so many bad pathways. You know, I truly feel that what's happened is there's a disconnect between this clever brain and the human heart, it's love and compassion. And I truly believe that only when head and heart can work in harmony can we attain our true human potential. We've got ourselves into this mess. We have the intellect to get us out of it. So we need the heart to jump in and help us get there for the sake of the future. There's been some discussion this morning about the intensive farming of animals. And that's why I carry these little people. I've been noticing everybody who stood up here at the podium. This is Cow. Cow's head. Cow looks a bit sad, doesn't she? Well, she is. These intensive farms have been likened to concentration camps for animals by a survivor of the Holocaust. He wrote a book called Eternal Treblinka. Anybody who's either been in one of these farms or seen secretly filmed videos knows the horrendous cruelty. Pigs, this is piglet. Pigs are as intelligent as dogs. Both of them are sentient beings. Both of them feel fear, fear and pain. But let's leave that aside for the moment. These billions of animals who are now bred in this disgusting way have to be fed. Areas of habitat are destroyed to grow the brain, often forests because the soil initially is very fertile. A lot of uh, gas is used to get the brain to the animals, the animals to the abattoir, and the meat to the table. But in addition to that, uh, during digestion, these animals, like all of us, produce methane gas. And although we know that the emission of fossil fuels is the main contributor to the so-called greenhouse gases, these gases that blanket the globe and trap the heat of the sun, leading to climate change. But a very major greenhouse gas is methane. And a large percentage of methane comes from the intensive farming of animals and our desire to eat more and more and more meat. And not only is it better for us if we don't eat meat, it's a lot better for the environment. And that's why a lot of people are just... <laughs> so we are now right bang in, as somebody said, the middle of the climate crisis. Isn't it lucky that this uh, convention wasn't two days earlier? because a lot of people wouldn't have been able to come to the violent storms that were buffeting Europe. And we all know the hurricanes and the tornadoes have got worse and more frequent. 
we know that the flooding and the droughts are worse and more frequent. Climate change is not something that might happen in the future. It's right here and now, along with the extinction of animals and plants on the planet. And it's a real crisis. And we're surrounded by doom and gloom. Open the newspaper every day, listen to the news, and it's all about the damaging things that we are doing to the planet the problems that we're having politically and socially, the unrest, the desire for change, the anger. It's not surprising that young people around the world are becoming, many of them are just apathetic, they don't seem to care. They just, you know, eat, drink and be merry, but tomorrow we die. Some are really depressed, and some are angry and violent, and I don't blame them. When I was traveling around the world, which I still do, I was meeting young people, mostly high school, university, and I asked them, why do you feel like this? And they all said more or less the same, because you're harming our future and there's nothing we can do about it. There's a saying that we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children. No, we've stolen. We're still stealing our children's future today. But is it too late? They're often told it's too late. We have all these prophets of doom who say we've passed the, we've passed the tipping point and nothing we can do now is going to save us. But I don't agree, and luckily a lot of other scientists don't agree also. We have a window of time that's closing. So because I, I care about young people, I've got three grandchildren myself, and so I began this program, Roots and Shoots, back in 1991. And the main message was that every individual makes a difference every single day. And every group chooses projects to do. They choose them. We don't tell them. They choose projects to make the world a better place. One for people, one for animals, one for the environment, because we are all interrelated. And it's growing fast in Germany. We've got the, the chair and the executive director and volunteers from JTI Germany in this room. We've got Lawrence and Sebastian and Oli, so just wave because I wouldn't be here but for them. So just please wave. And so <laughs> what began with 12 high school students in Tanzania back in 1991 is now in 163 countries and growing. We have members in preschool, not many, but lots in kindergarten, very strong in university, and everything in between. And it's my greatest reason for hope. And I'll have you know that very many of these groups all around the planet are going organic. They're growing organic vegetables in their school gardens. They're taking those organic vegetables to feed old people or to feed themselves in their, for their lunch. There's two groups that are growing organic vegetables for animals in a nearby zoo that doesn't have very much money. And so they're very passionate about this organic movement. They're the ones who are going to change their parents and their grandparents. They're the ones who are going to be the future consumers and understand the importance of buying products that enable us to look forward to a sustainable future. The Roots and Shoots groups are fascinated, the older ones, by permaculture and aquaponics, both highly sustainable and good for the planet. Um, there's a huge movement around the world to do something about our overuse of plastic, to try and stop the use of plastic. And it's what gives me the greatest hope. Everywhere I go, there are young people with shining eyes wanting to tell Dr. Jane what they've been doing to make this a better world. But let's also come back to this brain. We've got ourselves into this mess, but we do have the wherewithal, the ability to get ourselves out of it. And there are amazing innovations, even now new ones that I'm not even allowed to talk about, that are going to make us 
able to live in better harmony with nature. Prohibibi is a company that has designed, and it's not the only one I know, but it's a very successful one, and it's designed a product which you tie in little bags around a field of crops, and it, it messes up the sensory perception of the male moth. The female is giving out these pheromones to attract her mate, but the mate is getting mixed signals. He doesn't find the female, and so nothing's killed, but the pest is diminished. It's had field trials in many parts of the world, and the production of that crop has gone up. And so it's very successful, and it gives work to the local people as well. So there are so many things like this. And each one of us in our lives, too, can think about our environmental footprint, think about what we buy, what we eat, what we, what we wear. It's got to be organic. And we need to get organic cotton, too. And if we must eat animals, which I am afraid I can't, then they must be raised in a decent, humane way and fed, not fed, ground up chicken bones, which led to the mad cow disease, but fed the sort of food that cows really need to eat. And <laughs> there's all these products now beyond meat and impossible burgers and things like that. So people, even if they love meat, they don't have to kill animals to eat meat anymore because it tastes exactly the same. In fact, it tastes so like meat, I can't eat it. <laughs> Um, I was just in Davos, and there we launched the Trillion Tree Project. It's being worked out that if we can plant a trillion trees, of course, this is going way into the future. I don't know if it'll work, but that would absorb the uh, excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So all over the world now, people are planting trees. It can only help. Trees are wonderful for absorbing the carbon dioxide. Removing the plastic will help the oceans. Stopping conventional industrial farming will stop the runoff going into the rivers and increasing the pollution of the ocean. So as consumers, which each one of us is, I keep hearing, you know, organic food, I'd love to buy it, it's, 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 but it's more expensive. But you know something, I grew up in World War II in England when food was rationed. We valued food, we valued everything, we valued one square of chocolate. If something does cost a bit more, and it's good for the environment and your health, then buy it, value it, and you won't waste it. We waste so much food today, it's one of the big problems. So each one of us can make a difference every single day. And that is my greatest hope for the future the indomitable human spirit. Mr. H travels with me for 29 years now, given to me by a man who went blind at 21. He decided to become a magician. He was told, Gary, you can't be a good magician if you're blind. He said, well, I can try. If he was standing here, you wouldn't know he was blind. He arranges everything beforehand. He unerringly picks up the right spot. And his name is Gary Horn, which is why this is Mr. H. He does shows for children. And he says, something may go wrong in your life, because you never know. But if it does, don't give up. There's always a way forward. He does skydiving. Firstly, I think it's insane to jump out of an airplane anyway. But to jump out into pitch blackness, well, that's worse than insane. But anyway, he's just taught himself to paint, and he's done a little book called Blind Artist. There's a portrait of Mr. H in it, and he's never seen him. He's only felt him. If you see that portrait, you'd be amazed. So there are my reasons for hope. The indomitable human spirit, the energy and commitment of young people, the extraordinary brain, and the resilience of nature if we give her a chance as shown in organic farming. She will come back, restore fertility to the land in an organic, sustainable way. Thank you very much.
thank you all. Thank you for your very inspiring speech. And thank you. It's really an honor to have you here.